let's bring in our next guest, Stevie Sahoyas of North Star Bets. Stevie, um, main reason why Florida was able to pick up the win in Game Three was what? Sergey Bobrovsky. Like I'm just gonna, we're just gonna keep coming back to this every time yeah. the Panthers win. It's Sergey Bobrovsky. They still can't score more than two goals in regulation. I think that's nine of their last ten games. They've been stuck on two through sixty. So it's definitely not the offense, but Bobrovsky made some key saves, especially that one at the end of the second period. Uh, I can't remember who it was on the doorstep, but Bobrovsky kind of like threw it to them. It might have been Carlson. And he, it was a good save on the initial shot. Then he gives up a horrible rebound, but is able to get the blocker on it. Like he just was able to rebound and just play extremely well after being pulled in game two. So I got to go with Bobrovsky. Yeah, I mean, isn't it seven straight overtime wins? Well, not straight, but seven overtime wins in these playoffs, I think, so far for Florida. It's incredible. Did Montreal have 11 straight, I think, in 93? When they won the cup, I think it was 11 think straight or something ridiculous. Yeah. It's just insane. But Florida are the favorites entering game two uh, tomorrow, I think at minus 125. But Vegas, like Alan mentioned, was, I think, the better team overall. Um, wh why are those odds as they are? Just because the home ice advantage, do you think? I think so. You're not going to see much deviation from the odds as they were entering game three, where you had Florida again as a slight favorite. I think just because they won, they're going to hold up there as slight favorites. Home ice advantage. Sure, you know, that crowd was pretty dead until they tied it, to be honest. like It was it was not a great home crowd advantage for the Panthers last night. But I think there's something to be said about the time change for Vegas, getting used to playing at 5 local time and then having to play at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Definitely maybe has some impact in this series. But I, if I'm betting that game, I'm betting Vegas tomorrow night. My prediction was the Golden Knights in 5, and, I'm glad the Panthers won because I still feel really good about it. The, the win, the Florida win was the part I was kind of holding out on. I wasn't sure if it was going to happen, but we got in the game. So so Golden Knights in five. Golden Knights in five. Now, Matthew Kachuk did make a, his presence felt on the score sheet kind of for the first time, really, this series. You know, he had took that big hit, you know, went away for a bit, came back, tied the game. Could that be something that propels or as a rallying point for the Florida Panthers to – get back and even the series up? I don't think so. I think it's a deterrent. I think we saw Kachuk come back and be less than 100% in that game last night. He was not his old self. The puck battles weren't there. I mean, he got lucky on the goal. It bounced right to him in front of the net. He had a yawning cage. But that injury and the Montour injury, I think, are two big reasons for concern. Mm -hmm. Montour especially, because that guy just eats so many minutes. I mean, he plays like half the game out there. So with him being hurt, on a Florida defense that isn't the deepest unit to begin with, I think those two injuries, not going to be rallying cries for Florida, but irreplaceable losses. I know they'll both play. They're both most likely going to suit up in that game on Saturday night, but I highly doubt they're anywhere near 100%. Yeah, I mean, listen, Gouda should be out as well, let's be honest, right? I mean, he got rocked in that that last game, and then, oh, he's fine by, you know, two days later. I mean, that's the issue, I think, with the NHL and head injuries. I want to ask you, though, that, that cross-checking penalty he took, last night was just pathetic. I mean, he barely touched the guy. Um, the officials have been hammered throughout the, the playoffs. How would you rate them so far in the Stanley Cup final? I would say, okay, so that call was bad. That was definitely a horrible call on Gudis, but I would say they've been an eight because I think the one issue that you have with officiating the NHL is that there's no consistency. But these officials have consistently called everything by the book. Now, are they a little too strict like in the Gudis in, in, instance? Yes, that's where I knock him a couple of marks. But I would say that they've been pretty consistent with no extracurriculars. Once the whistle goes, there's a very low tolerance for what's accepted. And I think they've stuck by that for the majority of the Stanley Cup final. I, I, I have to say the officials have done a pretty good job. All right. Every time I bring you on here, we're going to talk about Conn Smythe as long as the Stanley <laughs> Cup final is alive. Our boy, our boy, Johnny Marshall Show. Look at this. Now he's the favorite. Uh, to win it all. The guy's unbelievable. He's got goals in his last four games, uh, five, six, seven, eight, and goals in seven of his last eight games as well. Is this if, if Vegas win this Stanley Cup, which I still think is very likely, I know you do too, is this his con smite? I'd say right now, he, the odds are about equally reflective as to his chances of winning it. He's yeah. been so good. Hill has been good in the in the playoffs. I'd say he's still the biggest Vegas threat to stealing the Smythe from Marchessault, but he's come up with big goal after big goal. 
And last night, again, he puts his team up 2-1. I thought that was going to hold up as, as, as the game winner as that game continued to go on. Uh, you know, Panthers tie it. But barring just a complete dud of a final two, three, however many games are left for March or so, I think it's his to lose at this point. Okay, let's talk about Bob Roski. So let's let's just say Florida somehow turn this around, come back, win this series. I'm going to assume they're going to be leaning on the play of Bob Roski. And at 8-1 to one right now, which is, I think, pretty good if you like Florida win this thing, I see that it's his to win. I agree. I think it's similar to what we've seen in the NBA where you've had, like, for most of the postseason, Jimmy Butler's odds attached to Miami's postseason odds and their right, NBA right. finals odds. Same with the Denver Nuggets and Nikola Jokic. Like, I think Bobrovsky has entered that stratosphere. I know Kachuk, he scores big goals, but that injury looks like it's going to be a problem. And forget the injury. Like, that, we can both agree that outside of the first 10 minutes, basically from when Kachuk got hurt onwards to those last maybe – four or five minutes of the third, Vegas was the better team in that game. And it was Sergei Bobrovsky that continues to give Kachuk opportunities to play hero. If it wasn't for Bobrovsky, there's no big Kachuk goals in this postseason because they've all been low-scoring games and they've all been games where Florida got outshot in. So if we're going to give it to anybody, it's got to be Bobrovsky. Okay, let's move on to some news that's uh, going on off the ice. The Leafs actually making some massive news in the <laughs> hockey world, you know, bringing in Shane Doan as an assistant advisor, I think his assistant role is. Advisor, assistant advisor. Assistant yeah. advisor, whatever the Leaf, that means. The Leafs market's amazing, <laughs> yes, isn't it? I got to ask Stevie about this. Um, so we were talking about this earlier. Like, what does this actually mean? Is this a ploy to hopefully, you know, keep Austin Matthews in Toronto? Is this a plan B? Is this a last-ditch last effort? What, what do you make of this appointment by the Toronto Maple Leafs? I'm pretty sure he's like the Dwight Schrute of the Maple Leafs now. He's not the assistant <laughs> general manager, but he's the assistant to the general the assistant, manager. Yeah. So what that person does, I don't know. What Shane Doan's going to do, though, and what Bradshaw Living's going to ask Shane Doan to do is, you know, text Austin Matthews a little bit. You know, just see how he's doing, you know, buddy-buddy with Matthews until we get this contract signed because that's the biggest issue. And that's the only reason why I could see them bringing Doan on board. I mean, he's a good hockey mind and he was a good player back in his day, but the Maple Leafs already have like a very big front office staff. Like there's a lot of people sitting in that boardroom. So I don't know if they needed another person, but they definitely needed someone who has a good relationship with Austin Matthews. And that's a box that Shane Doan certainly checks. Yeah. So Steve, I got, I got a question for you. So Albert seems to think that Shane Doan could be the reason that Austin Matthews takes a little no, bit no, of a pay that cut. Was, that was my theory. That's his theory. Sorry. His theory is that Shane Doan will be the factor that helps Austin Matthews take a pay cut. So Leafs can fill out the roster. Is there any no, substance? That's not to, exactly. Is, it, there, is there any substance to that? Or is that just simply blasphemous right there? I think that's blasphemous. Like we, we have not seen Austin Matthews do anything that indicates he's going to do the Maple Leafs any solids when it comes to contract negotiations. I mean, there's a reason why we're already talking about his contract extension because he wanted a five-year deal. And we all know that opened up the doors for free agency talk. That opened up the doors, especially with the no-move clause in the final year of his deal. That opened up the doors for all of this circus that's going to ensue in Toronto because – the chances that the, the Maple Leafs get a deal done before the season starts, I don't know about those because we've seen players just with less fanfare go into the season need an extension. Look at Pasternak on the Bruins. He needed an extension heading into this year. His contract was coming up. Boston gets it done in season. Nathan McKinnon, it was a similar deal. Needed to get an extension. He got it done in season. It's probably going to be the same with Matthews, except there's going to be so much more media speculation. You hear so many more rumors. This is going to be so much more surrounding that situation that uh, I think, you know, Matthews will will know willingly that uh, there's going to be a lot of talk over the next now until that contract is done. Couldn't Trey Living like hire Emma Matthews, his mom, to like a massive contract <laughs> as like what? assistant to the GM <laughs> for like twenty million a year and say, hey Austin, you know, nine a year, eight years, and we'll give you a little backhander through mom. Right. The well, league the thing, might frown upon that a little bit, possibly. Well, the thing is, they're going to get a bunch of money from paying Babcock all these years freed up at the end of the month. So that <laughs> there true. could That's be true, some, yeah. they could have a little bit more wiggle room <laughs> on the books there, the Maple Leafs. How, how did the Bruins, by the way, past the next deal is pretty team friendly, though. Right? I know they waited to in season that they, they gambled. Um, he was prepared, it seems, to have taken maybe less than he would have gotten in the open market, certainly. 
Um, what was the, the, the negotiating angle of Pasternak? I think there was a lot like with, with Pasternak, I think you're right. I think he could have got more on the open market. I mean, he just scored 60 goals. That's yeah. something that only a handful of players can do. Matthews scored 60. He's going to most likely make more than what Pasternak is making. So I think I, the key with, with keeping Pasternak there is like he just wanted to be in Boston. I still wouldn't say it's, it's uber team friendly. He's still making over 11. Less than market, I think, is the more uh, appropriate term to tag the the passion at contract because usually what you see is when one guy signs for a lucrative amount of dollars, the next guy who's up says, well, I want that and maybe a little bit more. And I'll tell you why I'm worth a little bit more. And they settle in something close to that range. Passion act settled in about one and a half, about one and a quarter less than what McKinnon signed for on a year to year basis. And given his goal scoring abilities, there definitely could have been a case to be made in negotiations for passion act side that, Hey, we could have got a little bit more out of that contract. Well, I think Pasta could have paid as, as high as McDavid or McKinnon based they on what he's doing, market, right? Yeah. So I guess he did take a bit of a haircut. He cares about winning, that's why. He cares about winning. <laughs> they don't do that in Toronto, right, Charm? So well, you make the case that's the truth, too. Stevie, thank you so much, man. We'll uh, have you back on soon.